Hello, my name is Min Jung Kim, and I'm the director and the CEO of the New Britain Museum of American Art. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture, focusing on women artists from the Hartford region, presented by Gary Noble, who is a devoted art collector, historian, and a trustee at the New Britain Museum of American Art. This lecture will explore the work of women artists who were part of the vibrant Hartford art scene in the 19th and the 20th centuries, including many who were featured in our museum's collection, including Grace Bibberts, Jane Peterson, and Margaret Miller Cooper, among many others. Today's program accompanies the museum's 2020 20 plus women at the NBMAA initiative launched in 2020 uh, January on the centennial of uh, women's suffrage in America. The initiative celebrates the invaluable contributions of women to the arts while seeking, seeking to increase representation of their work in our galleries. And as part of the initiative, the NBMAA devoted all of our special exhibitions throughout 2020 and now into 2021 to the work of women artists from diverse backgrounds and historical periods. And we are thrilled to present this program highlighting the achievements of Connecticut-based women artists. We are grateful to our presenting sponsors, Stanley Black & Decker, with additional support provided by Bank of America. Without further ado, I am honored to introduce Gary Noble. Following his years serving as Vice President of Data Management at the Hartford Insurance Group, Gary began collecting and researching the work of Hartford artists from the 1800s to the, to the present and undertaking in, inspired by one of his early professors at Yale University. Over the past seven years, he has written over 100 biographies of 19th and early 20th century artists who lived or practiced in the Hartford area and more than 20 extensive histories of art organizations in the Hartford area. He is currently in the process of compiling these biographies into a book on the history of the Hartford art world between 1800 and 1950. Gary is a beloved trustee of the New Britain Museum of American Art and an invaluable member of the NBMAA family. It's my pleasure to welcome Gary Noble. Thank you, man, very much. I am very well honored to have this opportunity. I'm certainly pleased to have this opportunity to share a little bit of what I have found out about the remarkable women artists that have been in Hartford uh, since the early 19th century. Actually, we're not gonna go quite back that far. Uh, but I'm gonna start off with Chick Austin, uh, as a lot of art talks start out uh, of Chick Austin. He came to Hartford in 1928, just one year uh, after, well, and, and shortly after that, less than one year after that, uh, he approached a couple of local Hartford women painters uh, and Jesse Goodwin Preston and Helen Townsend Stimson and suggested that they form a woman's artist group. He had, at that time, the Athenaeum was the primary uh, exhibit space in Hartford for artists. Uh, and he had kind of looked around and noticed that there were not a whole lot of women that were included in these groups that were exhibiting at the Athenaeum. So that's why he approached uh, uh, Preston and Stimson. It turned out that the, uh, they had a tremendous group of women artists to choose from in setting up this organization. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is where did all these women come from? Why were there so many uh, professional and talented women artists practicing in Hartford in a relatively small city? The story begins in, 1870, in, in 1872, uh, when a group of men got together to form the Hartford Art Association. Uh, I have highlighted, uh, highlighted Roswell Moore Shirtliff and Dwight Tryon here because both of those men have works in the collection of the New Britain Museum. And what they said is that they were gonna form this group really to promote the arts. And I'm going to read the last uh, phrase of this, uh, of this uh, um, statement here. Uh, it is time that our citizens were more generally awakened to the matter of native art 
and the prosperity of native and other artists who may be residing among this. At this time, there were a lot of art collectors in Hartford, uh, but they were mainly collecting European art. They were collecting the art of the old masters. And the purpose of this Hartford Art Association was really to showcase the work of local artists and try to get the collectors to focus on local artists. And in addition to that, uh, they were going to form the Connecticut School of Design, which was said to have been the first school in, in uh, Connecticut to follow the European model of instruction. The, they formed the group. They had their first exhibition on June 4th, 1872 with the Charter Oak Insurance Company. And here are the women that were included in that exhibition. And this is important because it's one of the very first lists of women painters that we have. Uh, there were, there were you know, isolated uh, women exhibits or women uh, participating in exhibits, but this really was the first list. And some of these names, uh, most of them now I have found first names. And I would say that one of the challenges of researching the art of women painters, particularly in the 19th century, is that it's difficult to know exactly who they are because they are usually Mrs. Such and Such. And in this case, we have one woman on the list. This is Mrs. Webster. Had no idea who, who Mrs. Webster is uh, because we don't have her husband's name. And even when you have the husband's name, very often you can't find the woman's name. I've been able to find them all except her. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue to work on that. Um, there were no officers in, in there, are no organizers uh, in this exhibit, but the women were obviously a very important part of it. Uh, they did have a second exhibition in 1873, uh, but that included only two women. Here are some examples of some of the works by these women. Uh, this work is in the collection of the New Britain Museum. Uh, I apologize for the photograph. It's, a, it's not a very good uh, quality photograph, but I think you can see how, how really beautiful this work is. Uh, this is Harriet Elizabeth Cheney. She was married to one of the Manchester Cheneys. Uh, she was born in Middletown in 1838, and she had exhibited quite widely. She had exhibited at the Boston Museum. Uh, she had exhibited at the National Academy in New York, uh, and she had quite a long and productive career. Uh, she died in Hartford uh, in 1913. Here's another woman, and I want you to remember this name, Esther S. D. Owen. I want you to even jot it down because this woman was obviously very prominent at the time. And I have been unable to find any example of her work other than this one black and white photograph from an old magazine uh, of a work called Lilies of the Valley. We need to find out more about Esther Owen. We need to know who she was and we need to find more examples of her work. Uh, she was from Boston. She was born in 1843 in Boston and she died in Hartford in 1927. Here is an example of Suzanne Porter. This work hangs in the uh, Isham Terry house. Uh, Suzanne Porter was a good friend of the two women who lived in the Isham Terry house. Uh, this extraordinary, very early uh, uh, landscape painting by a woman. Women generally painted uh, uh, other things besides landscapes, portraits and, and uh, and, and other things besides landscapes. So Suzanne Porter was one of the very, very early uh, landscape painters, and it's a it's really a splendid uh, little work of an untitled lake. She studied. Uh, she was born in Hartford. She was born 1839. Uh, she studied with Seth Cheney and William Ruthven Wheeler, two prominent uh, men uh, painters in Hartford. Uh, she also went to Paris, and she studied in Paris from 1873 to 75. And this is at exactly the same time that a group of men from Hartford had gone to Paris. Charles Noel Flagg, Robert Brandigy, and others. If you, uh, if you saw the uh, Farmington exhibit, you know a little bit about those folks. Uh, she was in Paris at the same time, and it's quite likely that, uh, uh, that she probably knew, uh, knew these men and had some contact with them. Uh, she died in Hartford in 1887. We're gonna see more examples of her work as we proceed. Here's a wonderful work 
uh, by Ellen Pomeroy. And Ellen Pomeroy is one of, she's one of the giants of the 19th century women painters. Uh, I have not seen this work in person, uh, but this is, I got this from the uh, Wadsworth Athenaeum website. Uh, it's, it's clearly a very, very uh, skilled still life of Ellen Pomeroy. She was born in Hartford in 1841. Uh, she, it is said that when she, she had scarlet fever as a, as a young girl, and that is supposed to have inspired her to become an artist. I don't quite know what the connection was, uh, maybe because she spent a lot of time alone or whatever, but uh, at any rate, she did, uh, she did become an artist. Uh, she studied in London at the same time that the famous black artist, Charles Ethan Porter, was studying in Paris, and we don't know when she died. Uh, we don't have a death date for her. It's, it's a little difficult to research her, uh, her personal information because there were two Ellen Pomeroy's in Hartford at exactly the same time. And it's difficult to know or to, to pin particular events to, to the correct uh, Ellen Pomeroy. That brings us to 1875 and to a group called the Women's Centennial Association of Hartford. Uh, this was a group of very prominent women. I uh, don't think any of them were artists, but they were prominent women in Hartford, and they got together to decide which women would be represented in the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. They, uh, many, many of them, uh, we really don't know who they were other than their husband's names. Again, you see many of them are Mrs. or uh, such and such. So it's hard to, to find out uh, uh, a lot about some of the ones who weren't so prominent. Uh, the, the group over at the Hartford Art Association, they were struggling. Uh, the school was doing okay, but they were struggling with organizing another exhibition. So the Hartford women knew that and they invited the men to join them in planning this Centennial Association exhibition. Uh, they named John Wells Stancliffe, who was uh, a prominent artist in Hartford at the time, was the president uh, of the group, and they invited him to become the chief organizer. I think they were throwing a little bit of a, uh, they, they were trying to assuage the men's, uh, uh, the men's pride a little bit. Uh, they did get, the, the exhibition did play, take place on November 11th, 1875, at the Phoenix Bank Building. Uh, at that time, most of the bank buildings and insurance buildings in downtown Hartford had some kind of an exhibition space on the first floor and then artist lofts on the upper floors. Uh, it was very common. Apparently, every one of the office buildings uh, accommodated artists. So there were quite a few artists in Hartford practicing at the time. Uh, here are the women that uh, participated or that were shown in the Centennial Loan Exhibition. Uh, some of these women, Ellen Case, I don't know anything about. Uh, Mrs. Burton, I don't even know who she is. Uh, we will see uh, some examples of Elizabeth Jerome, uh, Dr. Mrs. Olmsted, or Mrs. Dr. Olmsted, <laughs> don't know who she was, uh, but uh, Ellen Palmer, of course, Harriet Beecher Stowe, he know, and Susan Warner. Here are some examples of their works. Here's another work by Ellen Palmer, uh, a really beautiful still life uh, painted for the centennial. And as a, a subject here, she used the front page of the Hartford Current from May 19th, 1876. And I've actually looked at that page and some of the articles are the same, some are different. She's, uh, she's putting uh, some different things in here. The article on the left actually talks about how you can get from Hartford to Philadelphia by boat to attend the exhibition. Here's a work by Elizabeth Gilbert Jerome, another name that you wanna jot down because she was clearly a very accomplished artist. One of, again, one of the very early women uh, uh, artists of landscapes. Uh, she painted, uh, the only two examples I found, which you will see, are tropical. So she was painting in some of the same locations uh, that Frederick Church was painting. I have not been able to link her to Frederick Church directly, but we do know that she was living in Hartford and she lived a few doors away from Frederick Church. So it's very likely that she knew him and she certainly knew about him. Uh, so he may have been the one who inspired her uh, to paint these tropical landscapes. Uh, I don't know whether she actually went to the tropics or whether she was painting from, from other paintings, uh, but you know, that's, she's another one that we know, need to know a great uh, deal more about. Uh, interestingly enough, 
Uh, I don't know where any of her paintings are. I have two examples, but they came off of the web. They were works that were sold at auction. Uh, she was born in, Hart in New Haven, I'm sorry, in 1824. She studied in Hartford with a painter named Bush. Uh, she was certainly one of the earliest landscape painters, and she died in New Haven in 1910. Another example of her work, you can see really how, how what an accomplished uh, painter this, uh, this Ellen Pomeroy was. And of course, everybody knows Harriet Beecher Stowe, but I'm sure that a few of you, are, of that few of you have actually seen a, a, an example of her work. Here's an example of her work in the Stowe Center, and you can see what an accomplished painter she was. This is an extraordinarily beautiful work. And look at the composition, look at the way she's used the flowers with the hanging, uh, uh, probably Spanish moss in the background. Uh, so she was an accomplished, she was an accomplished painter, uh, which we very, very seldom uh, know. She was born in Litchfield in 1811, as, mo as most everyone knows, and she died in Hartford in 1896. In researching these artists, it's interesting uh, to use these Greer's uh, Hartford City directories. There's a complete set uh, over at the Connecticut Historical Society. And going through there, uh, you can find things that, uh, that are not, you really can't find anyplace else. Uh, around this time, around 1875, they began to list uh, people by category of profession. And so they listed 17 artists in the 1875 book, only two women, uh, Ellen Pomeroy, who we have already heard about, and a Miss Esther L. Smith. We know very little about Esther Smith. Uh, she, we, don't, we do know she was born in Hartford, in, in Connecticut. Uh, we do know that she had a sister, Sarah, who was also an artist. Uh, we do know that they were both portrait painters, uh, and uh, at least uh, 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 Esther, Esther had studied with Edwin White down in New York. Uh, but I haven't been able to find any examples uh, of Esther Smith's work. Well, the Centennial Exhibition did play, take place in Philadelphia in 1876. Here are the women that were included in the Women's Pavilion. That's the, uh, the, the, the uh, image you see. Uh, here are the women that were included. Uh, we know very little about most of these women, uh, but the research goes on. Here are the examples I've been able to find. Uh, this is a, a, a print uh, of a painting by uh, Susan Porter. And I included this because this painting was actually included in the Centennial Exhibition. That is one of the works that was in the Centennial Exhibition. Uh, we'll see a better example of her work uh, further on. Uh, here's actually, here's a landscape of hers. I uh, don't know where this is. It was, it was uh, again, it was pulled off the web. Uh, but you can see, you saw the work at the Ishan Terry House. Uh, you see this, uh, you can see that she was a very accomplished uh, painter. Then we come at, uh, this was a woman, Candace Wheeler. Uh, she attended the, uh, the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. And uh, she was a decorator. She's known actually as the, uh, the mother of decoration because she, did one of those, she was one of the first people to really concentrate on design and decoration as a profession. Uh, she worked with Louis Comfort Tiffany in New York and John Lafarge. Uh, and there was another woman as part of the group uh, named Elizabeth Custer. And yes, she is in fact, uh, the wife of the infamous General Custer of Custer's Last Stand. But uh, Pomeroy, or Candace Wheeler, was really impressed with the work she saw in the British Pavilion by women, the arts and crafts that she saw in the British Pavilion by women. And this gave her an idea uh, because at the time, uh, this is just after the Civil War, of course, and there were a lot of widows and, uh, and women who had lost their, their sons who had no means of support. And she saw this as an opportunity to provide a, a possible means of support for these women. So she proposed, uh, she wrote to, letter, to letters across the, uh, the country, uh, to women across the country, proposing that they form decorative art societies. And these societies would have two purposes. Uh, one would be to sponsor schools in order to train the women in how to make better arts and crafts. And secondarily, uh, to hold exhibitions of where the women could sell their works to benefit the Civil War widows. Uh, Wheeler was very well known in Hartford 
uh, because she had worked with Tiffany in designing the, uh, the Mark Twain house, uh, which had just been completed in 1871. And so the women of Hartford one, or were among the first groups, or one of the first groups actually, to respond to her. And this is what the Hartford Current had to say about the decorative art society that these women were talking about forming. They wanted to establish a place for the exhibition and sale of sculpture, painting, wood carvings, lace work, art, ecclesiastical needlework, and so forth, and things that women could make in their homes and that they could sell uh, in order to, to make a living. These are the women that formed the Hartford Decorative of Art Society. And they're all quite prominent and all of them probably well known to you. Here's Olivia Clemens. She's Mark Clemens' wife, uh, of course, better known as Mark Twain. Uh, here is a Mary Bushnell Cheney. She is the daughter of Horace Bushnell. And anyone who looks into Hartford art history in the 19th century knows that Horace Bushnell was one of the most influential people at the time because he was actually encouraging young people to become artists. Whereas Mark Twain and his friend, uh, the Reverend Twitchell over at the Asylum Hill Congregation were actually trying to discourage men from becoming artists because they said, you won't be able to, to support your families. Uh, so the Bushman was, was, he was pushing uh, young people to become artists. And this is his daughter and she herself was an artist. Uh, Suzanne Warder was the husband of Charles Dudley Warner, who was the editor of the Hartford Current. And she was also an accomplished artist. And we will see, see some examples of her work. Uh, Elizabeth Colt Jarvis was the widow of Samuel Colt. Uh, she was not a, an artist herself, but she was certainly an avid collector. And then of course, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and we have, uh, we've seen an example of what a splendid artist she was. Here are the names, and I'm not going to read them, but here are the names of the, uh, the people who created the Hartford Society of Decorative Arts. Uh, you'll see some names, prominent Hartford names that you recognize there. Uh, then Mrs. Day shown here uh, is the mother of Catherine Seymour Day and we'll hear quite a bit about her later on. They did two things. They, they had the, the uh, Hartford Art Society or the, the Decorative Art Society and they created a school and it was called the School of the Hartford Society of Decorative, Decorative, Decorative Arts. Uh, it is the third oldest art school in the country. It's only behind the Art Students League in New York which was formed in 1875, just a couple of years earlier, and the Boston Museum, the School at the Boston Museum, uh, that was formed in 1876. Uh, it is now, of course, known as the Hartford Art School at the University of Hartford. The first instructors were two young women from Boston. They were students of William Morris Hunt, uh, and they came down to Hartford to run the school. The school was so successful I mean, it took off uh, like wildfire. I think, I think within three months, uh, they had more than 40 students. So it just, it just uh, took off like wildfire flyer. And the, uh, the women decided that they wanted to have a professional artist, a well-known professional artist uh, to come in and teach occasionally. So they went up uh, to Northampton and they approached James Wells, James Wells Champney, who had just started the same year, had just started the art school at Smith. Uh, and they approached Champney and asked him to come down to Hartford once a week to teach the mainly women students at the Hartford Art School. He was the first in a long line of very prominent painters who became the directors or the principal instructors at the art school. And here's the list. Uh, the folks uh, here that are in, in bold type are represented in the collection of the New Britain Museum of American Art. Uh, you will recognize many of these names, Dwight Tryon, uh, Henry Cook White, uh, and uh, William Merritt Chase, Walter Griffin, Robert Logan. Uh, all really accomplished, very accomplished uh, uh, painters at their time, who all were instructors at the Hartford Art School. The two names that I wanna focus on, two, two names that really deserve special notice are Mary Rogers Williams and William Merritt Chase. William Merritt Chase was probably the most influential uh, director or uh, instructor at the Hartford Art School. And he, he, uh, he taught 
many, many, many of the Hartford women. Uh, he came to Hartford once a week from New York. Uh, he taught full time uh, at his school in New York. And he also had a summer school in his estate on Long Island. So he taught just a long list of Hartford women. Uh, some of the ones that are better known, Catherine Seymour Day, we'll meet her later. Mabel Bacon at Plimpton English, we'll meet her. Frances Hudson Stores. Jesse Goodwin Preston, she was one of the women that worked with Chick Austin. Uh, Edith Dale Monson and Edith Dimock, just a few of the uh, Hartford women painters who studied with William Merritt Chase. Edith Dimock, by the way, is the wife of William Glackens. Uh, and she lived, she lived on uh, Farmington Avenue in Hartford. And then Mary Rogers Williams. And Mary Rogers Williams really is a woman that you all need to know. Unfortunately, it's easy for you to get to know her uh, because Eve Kahn, who I'm sure many of you know personally, uh, has written a book titled Forever Seeing Beauties, published a couple of years ago. That is a biography of Mary Rogers Chase. So any of you that are interested uh, in art of this period, I really recommend that you, you, that you pursue this book, Forever Seeing Beauties by Eve Kahn. The art school uh, was located in several uh, several locations around the city during its lifetime. It started off in the Cheney Block, up in the uh, up in the tower there of the Cheney Block, uh, that that at that time had that uh, that wonderful uh, little little top to it, a roof to it. Uh, it's now the Brown Thompson Building downtown. It still, thankfully, still exists. Uh, but the tower there was a favorite place. Uh, for the local Hartford artists. They loved to have their studios up there. The views were extraordinary. It was, it was um, you know, other than the churches, it was the tallest building in, in town. Uh, so many people like uh, Charles Noel Flagg and William Gedney Bunce had their studios there. So that's where the Hartford Art School started out. It uh, pretty quickly outgrew the space there and moved across the street to the Phoenix, Phoenix Insurance Company that had just been completed. Uh, it was there for a few years. Uh, then it moved over to the Wadsworth Athenaeum. They had expanded. Uh, they had some spa available space, so it moved over there. It stayed there for a while, and then they built their own building up on Collins Street, 280 Collins Street. Uh, unfortunately, it no longer is there. It's now uh, it's now apartments. Uh, but uh, they, they were there for quite a while uh, until Chick Austin, when he came to town, he convinced them to come back to the Athenaeum after the Athenaeum had expanded again. And so they ended up uh, back at the Athenaeum until they joined the University of Hartford and moved out to the University of Hartford campus. Here's some uh, flyers, early flyers from the, uh, the art school, uh, beautifully hand-drawn flyers uh, advertising the art school and advertising its, uh, its various classes. Uh, really lovely, lovely little flyer here. Uh, here's some advertisement from a little later on. This is 1915 uh, when uh, uh, Robert Logan was the, uh, the principal instructor uh, and showing the women, showing the women in the classes uh, and, and uh, um, advertising the art school. So the art school really was a very, very successful, very important in the history of women artists because most of the students at the art school were women. The school, the art school was held during the day and most of the men who were studying art had jobs during the day. So they were studying over at Charles Noel Flagg's uh, Art Students League, which had its classes at night. I want to spend a minute talking about Harry, Harold uh, Willard French's book, Art and Artists in Connecticut. He published it in, in 1879, and it's a blessing that he did, because I will tell you, we would not know anything about so many of these women had it not been for French. He sent letters around to every every person, every artist that he knew in Connecticut, inviting them to write a couple of paragraphs to for him to include in his book. And he did, he did in fact publish the book. There were 140 men in the book and as many as 26 women. Now he knew that there were more women artists than that. Uh, and he, this, he actually, this quote here is actually from the introduction to his book uh, where he says that he knows that there are scores of women in Connecticut today who are admirable artists but very few who are willing to be known as professionals. All honored to the few. And if women as a class realize their powers of production as they understand their powers of persuasion, there would surely be much more boldness in the subject of art. Here are the women that 
French included in his, in his book. Uh, again, I'm not going to read all of these names, but this is an incredibly valuable resource uh, for understanding what was going on uh, in the women artists at the time. Uh, I've only been able to locate a few images. Um, many, of these, many of these women, I really can't find anything about, uh, but he, French, was, was uh, uh, wise enough to include their locations, uh, so that can help us pinpoint uh, learning more about these artists. Here are some of the ones I found. Uh, here's a woman, Jeanette Loop is her name. Uh, she was born in New Haven. She married her art teacher, who was Henry Augustus Loop, and he was quite prominent at the time. He became a fellow of the National Academy. She became, she got as far as an associate of the National Academy, but she never quite made it to fellow. Uh, she was born in New Haven in 1840, and she died up in Saratoga in 1901. And I want you to look at this splendid portrait uh, that she did of a young girl. Don't know where this is. This is off of the web. It was sold at auction. Uh, don't know where it is, but it is a beautiful, beautiful portrait. And here's another example of Suzanne Porter, this time a, 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 a portrait uh, who, a portrait of Angie Tissier, again, a work we don't know where it is, but here's a work we do know where it is, uh, by Mary Tiffany. This is uh, also in the, in the, ter in the uh, Terry Isham house. Uh, she was a very, very close friend of the two women who lived in the Terry Isham house. And this is her portrait of Grace Terry Isham, who was one of the two women living in the house. A very strange portrait by Caroline Munger Washburn. She, uh, uh, she lived in, in Madison and Madison has actually quite a few of her works, uh, but quite an arresting image if, uh, if, a, if a very strange 19th century Victorian image. Uh, here's a, a poor photograph of a work by Mary Weston, uh, probably looks like it's in the Farmington Valley. It might be looking up toward Talcott Hill in the Farmington Valley, but uh, uh, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to see a better photograph. This, uh, this, this work, we don't know where it is. Uh, she was born in Hebron, New Hampshire. Uh, if you read French, has an interesting little story about her. She apparently kept running away from home when she was a little girl. She hated home. She was running away from home. And one time she actually made it to Hartford and a Presbyterian minister took her in and, uh, and she actually, then she studied art and she stayed in Hartford. Uh, but Mary Weston, we need to know more about, about Mary Weston. That sounds like an interesting story. Okay, that brings us to 1885 and the Hartford Art Club. And the Hartford Art Club is, is one of the most important organizations in Hartford as far as influencing women painters. Uh, Isabella Beecher Hooker, uh, the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, was the first president of the Hartford Art Club. Uh, they said this is they were forming the club really in order to, to learn more about art. It was primarily a lecture club. And the members uh, were prominent local media, local women uh, in Hartford who decided that they wanted to get together once a month and, uh, and have lectures on art. And these are the subjects, this is the first year uh, of their art. So you can see they're here, they're mostly talking about, uh, about old masters, European old masters. Uh, they did later on, they did begin to talk about uh, uh, more contemporary artists, but to start with, it was a pretty conservative bunch. Here's another giant uh, in the Hartford Women Painters, another name that you, you need to write down. Uh, we do know a lot about her. Her name is Mabel Bacon Plimpton English. Uh, her husband was a vice president of the insurance company. She was very wealthy. Uh, she joined the Hartford Art Club in 1893 at the age 32. Uh, she also uh, studied at the uh, Hartford Art School for many, many years. In fact, she studied there so long that she became a, uh, a, a, a member of the uh, governing committee of the art school while she was still studying at the art school. Uh, she became president of the Hartford Art Club in 1895, and she remained president until she died in 1944. And one of the things that she did, and it is really hard to overstate the importance of this, but she shifted the focus of the Hartford Art Club away from uh, just having lectures on arts, but actually to have exhibitions of, of local artists, of members of the Hartford Art Club. So very early on, the Hartford Art Club shifted from just being a social group 
to really being a, a place where, where women artists particularly uh, could, could meet, could have their works shown, and the lectures became more and more, more and more contemporary. This brings us to 1892, and this is another group of men. Most of them were either teachers or students uh, of Charles Noel Flagg's uh, school. Uh, many of the names uh, will be familiar to you because they're represented in the New Britain collection. Uh, Charles Gedney Bunce, William Mark Shirtliff, uh, Jared Flagg, uh, uh, William Ruffin Wheeler, Charles Bowling Brandigy, uh, these names there, these were the, these were the prominent uh, male students. I've included this uh, because I'm gonna, and I'm gonna actually read this, uh, this wonderful uh, uh, passage that appeared in the Hartford Current. Uh, Last summer, a number of artists uh, were somewhat lazily enjoying rural life and scenery in Farmington. They smoked and talked, and when the spirit moved them, they painted. Out of their talk grew the idea of forming a society of artists who had been both born or had lived for one year in Hartford or Hartford County. Thus, on July 24th, 1892, the Society of Hartford Artists came into being. None of its projectors now claims Hartford as his home, but all are more or less identified with the city. The objects of the society were declared to be the promotion of artistic interests of every description and the cultivation of a popular taste in art. What they were really looking for was a place to exhibit, a place where they could regularly exhibit. Uh, the, uh, the Wadsworth Athenaeum was not exhibiting uh, other art. They basically were just showing uh, the collection they had. And there really was no, uh, no venue where the artist could show. So that was really their primary purpose. Um, there were some women, although there were no women in the founders uh, smoking and painting out in Hartford, uh, out in Farmington, uh, there were several women who were in the first exhibition. Uh, we've already met uh, Mabel English, uh, a Mary Bishop, Helen Francis, she called herself Hattie Andrews, uh, Louise Williams, and a Mrs. S. Hall. Uh, some of these, like Mrs. S. Hall, I have no idea who she is. Uh, and we probably need to, uh, uh, to find out. Uh, here are the examples of the work. Here's, here's a, an example of Mabel English's work. Uh, this is from the English family. Uh, the English family has quite a collection uh, of her works, uh, but a wonderful uh, Rocky Hillside, probably down around Old Lyme. She had a summer home uh, down in Rhode Island on the coast. Here's Louise Williams. Louise Williams uh, was another of those, uh, those prominent uh, uh, Hartford women. She had she went to the art school, and she was one of the first women to win a prize. The Hartford Art School had a scholarship uh, at that time uh, that if you won the scholarship, you could study for two years at the art school in Boston. And then Boston had a similar prize called the Page Scholarship uh, that allowed you to study for, for or to travel actually for two years in Europe. Uh, Louise Williams was, I think, the first woman to win those two scholarships. And you can see that she was quite an accomplished, uh, accomplished painter. I have been unable to find a single example of her work in any of the local museums or any local collections. Again, this one is scraped, scraped off the web. Uh, so we need to get out there and find some work by Louise Williams. Now let's look at uh, the city directory. We're 25 years later, and by this time we now have 29 artists, and 15 of them are women. So more than half of them are women. Uh, that was, uh, you know, remember back in uh, 1875, we only had 17 artists and only two women. Uh, these are the women that were included. Uh, again, I'm not going to remain. Uh, I'm not going to read these names, but I will tell you, little is known about any of them except for Talcott, uh, Louise Williams, and Mary Rogers Williams. Uh, we've saw, seen uh, uh, Louise Williams, and uh, um, we don't we don't have a, an example by Mary Rogers Williams, but here is an example by Sarah Talcott, and this is in the New Britain Museum's collection. I haven't seen this work in, in person, so I don't know uh, exactly what it looks like in person, but to me, it is an extremely contemporary work for the time. Uh, Sarah Talcott, uh, she was something else. She lived down in Elmwood, 
Uh, she also, I believe she was later on associated with the Bristol Hartford Art League, but she was a splendid painter. And I'm delighted to know that the New Britain Museum has an example of her work. And here is Mary Rogers Williams. Remember, we talked about her before. She was the woman that, that uh, helped, uh, uh, helped uh, teach at the art school. This is her portrait of Henry Kirk White, a splendid portrait, belongs to the White family. Uh, I, I actually have seen this in person. This was in an exhibition a couple of years ago down at the Florence Griswold Museum. And it is a spectacular uh, a, a painting or a portrait uh, of Henry Kirk White. That brings us to 1903 and the Hartford Arts and Crafts Club, another one of the very influential groups in promoting the work of women artists. Uh, it actually was inspired by the English arts and crafts movement, and I'm not gonna go into, into a lot of detail here, uh, but there were three men in England, uh, Augustus Pugin, uh, you may not know his name, but he, you do know his uh, influence. Uh, he's responsible for the Gothic revival architectural style, which almost everybody knows. Uh, John Ruskin was an art critic. He taught at Oxford. He was uh, one of Oscar Wilde's primary inspirations. And William Morris, most of you uh, know probably of him from his textile design, but he was also a poet and a novelist. Uh, these three men uh, formed the, uh, the arts and crafts movement because they really felt that the machine made objects that had been introduced as a result of the industrial revolution were poorly designed and that this poor design was actually uh, having a, a negative impact on the morals of society. So their purpose was really to, to go back to handmade objects and well-made objects and focusing on aesthetics, uh, on the aesthetics of the objects that you had in your home. You can see a little bit of Oscar Wilde there because that was one of his, uh, that was one of his things. And in fact, they went, they went so far as to say that, uh, that the lack of good design and good architecture uh, was resulting in the deterioration of the moral and social health of society. Uh, I'm not going to read this, but uh, they basically said here, one of the things they were recommending was better education of artists, teaching, teaching people how to make good arts and crafts. And of course, the, the Decorative Arts Society uh, is a part of that movement, but uh, in, excuse me, in, uh, in 1903, uh, the woman named Carolyn Maria Hewitt invited a group of local educators and mainly secondary school educators to group, come together to begin to, to, first of all, teach people how to make good art, but also to learn themselves what, 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 good, what good aesthetics meant, to really study aesthetics. Uh, Caroline Maria Hewins is really one of the, one of the giants uh, of Hartford. She came down from Boston to form the uh, Hartford Public Library, one of the oldest public libraries in the country, and she had a major influence on the, uh, on the, the uh, I say, aesthetic life in Hartford. This is a quote that uh, I took from the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, where she said, we Yankees in our intense longing for usefulness teach many facts, which may well be left until manhood and womanhood, our, and appeal too little to the sense of beauty, which if not found in childhood is forever lost. So she wants to teach the kids in the public high schools about aesthetics. The original members were mainly teachers from the public high schools, here are a couple of them, and they would have exhibitions of, they would have lectures, exhibitions, workshops uh, to actually teach the teachers how to teach better arts and crafts. Uh, one, of the one of the people that lectured frequently at the Hartford Arts and Crafts Club uh, over the years. In fact, he lectured from 1905 to 1919. He would come up here sometimes two or three times a year from New York to lecture. Uh, his name may be familiar to him, to, uh, to you, uh, because the Parsons School of Design in New York at the New School in New York is named after him. He taught at the New York Art School, which later became the Parsons School, and he was a very, very influential uh, a teacher at the time. Here are some of the subjects he addressed over the years. Uh, a lot of these, I'd love to hear a lot of these. I love art as a factor in rational living, uh, not down near, near the bottom. So he had a major influence. And the school, uh, the, the Hartford Arts and Crafts Club, uh, we see Mabel English again. She joined them in 1905. 
Sarah Talcott was a president of the school in 1916, uh, but with Mabel English, the school began to shift or the, the, the society began to shift uh, from teachers in the public schools to local artists, to local women, primarily women artists, but local artists in general, uh, to learn more about aesthetics, to learn more about arts and crafts. Uh, they were a pretty conservative group. Uh, here is Frank Gay. Frank Gay was the first, <coughs> excuse me, the first named uh, director of the Athenaeum. He became the director in 1911, and he was the director until he was replaced by Chick Austin 15 years later. But here's what Mr. Gay had to say about contemporary art. The promotion of this new art known as post-impressionist work, Mr. Gay ascribed to the propensities of cubists and futurists. Its tendencies, Mr. Gay said, were pernicious to society and morality and breeded much that was vulgar. So this was a pretty conservative group. Uh, but remember that 15 years later, he was replaced by Chick Austin. And by 1930, they're hearing lectures from Austin and James Selby and Paul Cooley on contemporary French modernism. So the group did shift. It started out conservative, uh, but it became pretty liberal. Here is a quote from the Hartford Current, 1928. This was a lecture that uh, Theodore Frankel gave to the Hearts and Arts and Crafts Club. He says, now modernism has come to Hartford under the patronage of the Athenaeum and the Arts and Crafts Club. Next week may see the beginnings of a great change in our shops, our restaurants, our offices, and finally our homes. William Morris died fighting against the machine age, but the machine survived. Our progress of future does not depend on fighting modernism, but on educating ourselves to be part of the world we live in. So the, the Arts and Crafts Club had shifted from the conservative group that started out or teaching, teaching the local uh, uh, school teachers how to teach art into a club that really was promoting uh, modernism. And in fact, after this lecture was delivered, uh, the members of the club toured Chick Austin's newly decorated Bauhaus apartment nearby. Here are some of the women who were members of the Hartford Arts and Crafts Club, and uh, we're going to hear a lot more about every one of these women. Uh, this is Catherine Seymour Day. She's the woman who saved the Mark Twain house. Uh, Ruth Miriam Cogswell, her husband was a prominent local businessman. Mabel Bacon English, we've heard a lot about her. Uh, Frances Hudson Stores, she was a good friend of English and Day. Uh, and a, a very, very prominent artist at the time, uh, Inez Temple, uh, Jermaine Cherie, she, uh, worked, she uh, taught at uh, Loomis, Jessie Goodwin Preston, now we know her, she was one of the women that, uh, that Austin approached, uh, Helen Townsend Stimson, the other one, and Cornelia Coles Venner, who was a really a prominent and very wonderful artist. Uh, she is in the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, and uh, we'll, we'll, we, we do have examples, some good examples of her works. That takes us to 1906 uh, and the Connecticut World's Fair. Uh, Charles Noel Flagg was responsible for deciding what works of art would hang in the Connecticut Pavilion at the World's Fair. And these are the three women that he chose to include in the Connecticut Pavilion in the World's Fair. And here is this Esther S.D. Owen. I told you about her earlier. I told you to write down her name. If she was a good enough artist and an important enough artist for the, the Charles Noel Flagg, who was no pushover, to include as one of the three women that he would show in the Connecticut Pavilion, she must have been something. So we need to know more about her. We need to find some examples of her work. We need to resurrect uh, Mrs. Owen. By the way, these, these photographs were all from the catalog uh, of the World's Fair, so they were probably contemporary photographs uh, at the time. Here's an example of Frances Hudson stores, these over-the-top, beautiful, floral still lifes. Uh, this one is in the collection of the Town and County Club. It hangs prominently now uh, in their lobby, thanks to, to their becoming aware of what they had there. Uh, it's a, and they have they actually have another another wonderful one that's not shown that I didn't 
uh, get an image of. And there are several works by Francis Hudson Storrs uh, in the Stowe collection uh, over at the, uh, at the Stowe House. Here's another example of Mabel English, uh, another uh, uh, landscape through the pasture. Uh, we do know where this work is. And that brings us to the Connecticut Academy of Fine Arts. So I told you that the, that the artists had been struggling with finding a place to regularly show their works. Uh, so the main, the main uh, inspiration behind the Connecticut Academy was to try to accomplish what the old Hartford Art Society uh, couldn't accomplish, not, yes, the Hartford Art Society, <coughs> by forming the Connecticut Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, a lot of the, the men who formed uh, the, the, and this, this uh, painting, by the way, will be familiar to those of you who saw the Farmington exhibition. It's a painting by James Britton of the original governing council. Uh, you see them from left to right. I'm not going to read, read the names, uh, but they did get together and form the Connecticut Academy. Uh, this is their credo. I'm not going to read it, but they were looking for a place to showcase young artists and to teach the public that art was an indispensable necessity to comfortable living and intellectual advancement. So they're, they're piggybacking off of the arts and crafts movement and teaching that, that art really uh, was, was very important to society. Uh, they were mostly men. Uh, well, the, form, the, the people who formed it were all men, uh, but there were several women who participated in their first show. Uh, there were 75 participants in the first show and 15 of them were women. So 20% of the, uh, of the uh, people who showed were women. Uh, by 1925, that is 15 years later, there are now 112 participants and 41% are women. So it increased up to 37%. Here are excuse me, the women that showed uh, in the first show, uh, we've met uh, Mabel English, uh, Margaret Miller Cooper. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about her and see her some examples. She is well represented in the New Britain Museum's collection. Uh, Clara Mamrie Norton, uh, we will see works of hers. Uh, she was the first, by the way, uh, Clara Norton was the first woman to join the governing council of the Connecticut uh, Academy uh, in 1913. Uh, I'm, yes, she joined in 1913, and a few years before, Helen Andrews had become a member of the selection jury in 1913. So women were becoming more influential uh, in the Connecticut Academy. Uh, Storrs, English, Batchelder, Vetter, Preston, they all held leadership uh, positioned, uh, positions in the Academy by 1925. And here are a few images of works by these women. Here's another work by Mabel English. This is a watercolor, uh, the coast uh, probably off the Rhode Island coast. Uh, here is Margaret Cooper in the New Britain Museum, a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, landscape, probably, uh, well, Peggy's Co. I, I haven't looked up where that is, probably Nantucket. Uh, no, not, I'm, not, not, uh, Gloucester, so it's more likely Gloucester. I uh, should find out where that is. Uh, I haven't seen that in person, but it is a, a wonderful work. Uh, here's a beautiful portrait by Clara Norton. Uh, the family says that they think it's a self-portrait. Uh, I actually found the portrait, but then got to know the family and uh, they looked at it and they said, that, that, that's that gotta be a self-portrait of Clara Norton. She was very successful in New York, uh, but uh, her mother, uh, I guess she had an older sister who lived with the mother and the older sister got married and her mother said, I need somebody to live with me. So she had to move back to, uh, uh, to uh, the, the Hartford area and she became a very, very prominent member of the women's community in Hartford, the, the painters. Uh, this is Ruth Adwina Abbey. She's one of the more, more obscure of the women. Now we're moving into the 20th century. So we, we can find out a lot more about most of them, but uh, she's one of the more, obsc the more obscure ones. Uh, but I did find a, uh, one of her works over in the Raymond Library in East Hartford. So you can see she was, she was an accomplished uh, uh, painter. Uh, here's Adelaide Deming. Uh, she, was, uh, she lived in Litchfield, so the Litch Litchfield Historical Society has preserved a few of her works. I was not able to find any in any other uh, museums though in Hartford. Here's Hattie Andrews, and I'd love to know where this one is. Uh, it was one of those sold at auction. Uh, the only, only uh, example I've been able to find of her work, but what a, what a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, painting this one is. 
Uh, and here's Emma Wright, very contem contemporary uh, beach scene. Again, don't know where it is. Uh, Elsie Chase, Road Through the Autumn Woods, another, another beautiful, beautiful painting. And Lydia Field Emmett. And this uh, Lydia, the, the, uh, she's in the collection of the Britain Museum. She's, by the way, uh, a cousin of Henry and William James, and also a cousin of Ellen Emmett Rand, who some of you might have seen in the uh, in the National Academy show. That splendid uh, self-portrait of her uh, painting herself in that wonderful hat. Uh, this is, I think, this is her sister. Here is Matilda Brown. She was very prominent down at the old Lyme School. So the uh, Florence Griswold Museum has several examples of her work. Catherine Sims. I have not been able to find any work of Catherine Sims, but here's a photograph of Catherine Sims. Uh, so we need to we need to find a work by Catherine Sims. There's another example example of Sarah Talcott. Not a very good photograph, but a, an arresting image. And here's a beautiful work by Ariana, Ariana Kelly. Look at the colors and the uh, the, the, the molding in that. Uh, so uh, the, the association, the, the National, uh, the Connecticut Academy, uh, was run by women, uh, by men. But there were certainly a lot of good women painters that were involved uh, in their shows. That brings us to 1917. We're getting closer here, uh, and a gentleman named Nunzio Viana. Uh, 19, 1915, uh, Genny Bunce and Charles Noel Flagg both died uh, within a few weeks of each other. And they, they were really the, they were the giants uh, of the Hartford art scene at the time from a standpoint of, of, of organizations. They really, uh, they really dominated the Hartford art scene. And they both died uh, within a few months, a few weeks, I think, a few weeks of each other. Uh, so there was a little bit of disarray. The Connecticut Academy was, uh, their people were juggling for power. And Nuncio Viana came to town. He was, he was a contrarian, no, no question about it. Uh, but he decided that he had had it enough of the Connecticut Academy and, its, uh, and its, uh, its ways. They didn't like the jury system. And so he decided to revive the name of the Society of Connecticut Artists and to uh, form a, another society, primarily to show works. But he said, we don't want a stupid academy, and we will not have a society in which 20 members hold 20 offices and call each other by these names. Uh, there were four of our friends uh, involved with him in, the, uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this group, but they were also still showing over the Connecticut Academy. So while they were willing to, uh, to join Viana, they weren't quite as, doc uh, as a doctrinaire as he was. Uh, the group only had two exhibitions. There was one in 1917 and one in 1920, but they did have a lot of uh, a lot of lectures and, and it was kind of a, a club, a social club. Here's a wonderful example <coughs> of a work by Cornelia Coles Vetter. Uh, she is one of the giants, I think, of the time. She was really a modern woman. She she uh, uh, she studied under Henry in, in New York. She spent a lot of time with Henry in Europe. Uh, uh, study, uh, studying and painting in uh, in Spain and in Portugal, uh, she was she's she's uh, an artist uh, that that really should be uh, should be known a uh, better known than she is. Uh, this is her her uh, painting of Asylum Avenue in the snow. You can see the uh, the um, Asylum Hill Congregational Church uh, on the right. Here's another example of Adelaide Deming, uh, the woman from uh, Litchfield. So you can see by now we, these these women they're they're more contemporary and you can see that they are really are accomplished painters. Um, the Artist Club in Hartford it was another splinter group that Vianna organized. Uh, uh, other people had taken over his other club. Uh, it replaced the Society of Connecticut Artists. <coughs> Excuse me, kind of the same uh, uh, the same aim. They really wanted to showcase art. Uh, of the younger generation, <clears throat> they felt the older generation was too controlling. Uh, these are the women that participated uh, with him uh, in the first show, and a lot of these names now you know. 
Francis Storrs, Mabel English, Catherine Day, Inez Temple, Cornelia Vetter, Grace Fibberts, Maud Monnier, all those names you've seen. Uh, Alice Dunham, Esther Owen, there's Esther Owen. She's still alive and she's got to be very old by this time because she was, she was pretty old uh, at the St. Louis uh, Fair in 1907. Uh, Caroline Hewins, the librarian that we met, and uh, Norma Sloper were some of the some of the women that showed in that show in that uh, that showed in the first show. Uh, here's a work by Grace Vibberts that's in the New Britain Museum. Uh, Grace Vibberts was a very prominent early supporter of the museum, uh, and in fact, I believe that the first solo show that the New Britain Museum ever ever mounted was a solo show of the works by Grace Vibberts. Uh, so she's well represented in the museum's collection. Here's a floral still life by Maud Monnier that's in the uh, Monnier, in the possession of the Monnier family. Uh, and here's a wonderful portrait by Norma Sloper of Norma Wright. Uh, Norma Wright uh, and her husband lived in Farmington. He was a custodian at the uh, Miss Porter School uh, and they were one of the very, very few black families that were living in Farmington at the time. Uh, brings us to the Artist Club of Hartford. Uh, this is just, it's really another group uh, to get together and, and lecture and, and have social events and have teas and occasionally have exhibitions. Uh, but the group was quite conservative. Uh, here's Mr. Gay again lecturing to a different group. Uh, he said that he's glad that Cuba started, died out, perished with the war. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, he showed a copy of the Burlington Magazine, the greatest of the English art periodicals, which contained some samples of Cubist art, and they looked as if they might be suitable as designs for a linoleum floor covering. James Goodwin McManus said later that a distinguished artist had told him that Cubist pictures had a vogue for a time because they were easy. Uh, seven years later, Chick, Aust Chick Austin replaced Gay at the Athenaeum. They had exhibitions, lectures, social events, teas, uh, as they helped in saving the Twain House. Uh, and kind of their, their big event was in 1823, they held a masked ball at uh, the State Armory. I love this, this quote here, that milkmaids, pirates, hot and tots, and Hindus, Spanish maidens, Egyptian princesses danced to their heart's content and prizes were rewarded for the most excellent makeup before the Grand March. They were joined by students from the Hartford Art School, by the Art Students League, and even from the high school night art classes. Well, Vienna left Hartford in 1927. Uh, the club only lasted until 1929. A photograph of, uh, of 10 of our, of our artists, the three, three women in the front, uh, stores on the left, English in the middle, and Sloper on the right. Uh, with uh, the men behind him, Harold Green, uh, 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 James, sorry, sorry, James Goodman, McManus, Carl Ringius, Viana, and uh, Augusta Jones. Now we go back to the Greer's directory. This is now uh, 25 years on. We only find eight artists and four of them were women. Here are the four women, but clearly artists are there. You know, the, art, the art scene in Hartford was thriving. So artists had clearly found uh, another place to advertise. This brings us to the formation of the Town and County Club in 1925. The Town and County Club, I can't, again, I can't really overstate the importance that the Town and County Club has had in promoting Hartford women artists. Uh, they opened their doors in November of 1926 and their first, uh, their first activity was an art exhibition by six men from Boston. But the next month they had a, 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 a soul, I'm sorry, they had an exhibition of the works of Germaine Cherie and Nora Mills, who were two teachers at the Loomis School. And then in December of 1925, they gave their first solo exhibition to our friend Mabel English, the real doyenne of the Hartford women painters. Uh, they had shows uh, constantly. There was, there was an art show uh, at, the, at the Town and County Club uh, constantly uh, through 
through really through their history until today. Uh, but we can really find out a lot about uh, who was painting at the time by looking at their shows. Uh, they did start to have group shows uh, in February of each year, started in 27, and it ran for three years. And they were extremely important because they were not just women, they were men, but they were all of the really important local artists uh, that were painting in Hartford. So the Town and County Club was one of the most important outlets uh, for the contemporary artists practicing in Hartford. Here are uh, the women painters that were founders. All of these women were founders of the Town and County Club and they were painters. Uh, some of them we know, uh, we've met already, uh, but uh, some of them we haven't yet. Uh, Evelyn Longman Bachelor, she is probably the most prominent of all of these women. She had an international reputation as a sculptor. She worked with uh, French on the Lincoln Memorial. She has sculptures all over Hartford. The Spanish-American War uh, Memorial in Bushnell Park is hers. Uh, she, she, has, she has major sculptures all over New England, actually all over, all over America. Uh, then there's Ruth Miriam Cogswell, uh, Margaret Miller Cooper, Catherine Seymour Day, uh, Mabel English, Frances Storrs, Inez Temple, Muriel Ward. Uh, these were the women that, that were the, the, uh, the painters, the women painters that were founders of the art school. I'm not going to show a lot of examples of their works, but I will tell you that this spring, either late this spring or early fall, you will have, an, you have the opportunity to see a show dedicated to these women a show of works of these women, three or four works by each woman uh, at the Town and County Club. Uh, stay tuned for the, for the timing. Uh, they're talking, it really depends on, on how we advance with the pandemic, but I guarantee that sometime this year, uh, you will have the opportunity to attend uh, this show and learn more about these splendid women artists. And that brings us back to where we started. This is the Society of Hardware Women Painters and Sculptors. These are the women uh, that, that Preston uh, and, uh, and her friends uh, pulled together to form the Society of Hardware Women Painters and Sculptors. Uh, this is Ruth Edwina Abbey, Eleanor Lathrop Sears, uh, Evelyn Batchelder, Jemaine Cherie, Ruth Miriam Cogswell, Catherine Seymour Day, Margaret Miller Cooper, Mabel Bacon Plimpton English, Dorothy Alden Hapgood, Maud Nottingham Lemonier, Ruth Rising Goldie, and Eth Edith Dale Munson. There are works in the New Britain Museum by Evelyn Bashelder. I have not seen this work in the museum's collection. But there is, the, but this is this is from the collection at Loomis. But I'm sure that they are copies of the same work because they have the same title. Uh, this is called Negro Girl. As I say, I have not seen this in the Nubrit collection, and there's not an image on uh, the E Museum to show me whether or not it is this work. Uh, and then here's a beautiful work by Mar a watercolor by Margaret Miller Cooper. The museum has dozens of her watercolors that are all just as splendid as this one is. And here's a wonderful oil by Edith Dale Monson. So those are, the, those are the works in the collection by that group. Here are the rest of them. This is Clara Mamrie Norton, uh, Jesse Preston, Edith Briscoe Stevens, Eleanor Stoll, Francis Hudson Storrs, Inez Temple, Cornelia Coles Vetter, Grace Chamberlain Vibberts, Muriel Alvord Ward, and Carolyn Horsfall Wood. Uh, the Muni the uh, New Britain Museum has only one work by these women, and that's this uh, beautiful uh, oil by Grace Liberts, uh, the Edgartown Docks. I have not shown examples of the other women, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But here is a wonderful photograph of the women from their 1929. This is 13 of the of the 23 participants. Uh, this is this photograph uh, was appeared in the Hartford Times, taken in the exhibition hall. They're all wearing their painter's smocks and their painter's hats. And a couple of them have decided to go, uh, uh, to go cubist, <laughs> perish the thought. Uh, but these are some of the women that were in that show. 
the people, the, uh, and then here's a, here's a photograph of them a little bit later on, a couple of years later, uh, their dress is a little more conventional for the time. Uh, they've, they've become a little, a little more conventional in dress, but not in spirit, as we will, we will say. Now, the reason I'm not showing you uh, any more examples of these women's works is because this summer at the Art Museum at the University of St. Joseph's, you will have the opportunity to see examples of every single one of the 23 women. And I will tell you that a couple of them were real challenges because it looked like we weren't gonna find anything and they did turn up. So we have at least one work by each of the women. It's going to be accompanied by a catalog that will have biographies of the women. Uh, so it's, it's, it is really, going to tell you all about these 23 women, which is why I haven't gone into more detail here. But it is the result, as I say, it is the result of 50 years of support from a lot of organizations, many of them run by, by men, uh, many of them run by women, but the support and the result of a lot of organizations, uh, and we really do need to be proud uh, of these women. So where do we go from here? And this is really a challenge to all of you that uh, have made it this far in this presentation. Uh, 2025 is the centennial of the Town and County Club. Uh, let's hope that the Town and County Club takes advantage of that and maybe mounts a show of not just the women who showed at the Town and County Club, but the very, very excellent man painters who also showed at the Town and County Club. Uh, 2029, a little bit further off, but not that far, is the centennial of the Connecticut women artists. And I hope by that time that we don't just have one or two examples of work by these women, but we have dozens of examples. Uh, certainly more research on the early women painters. You don't need to worry about the 23 because we've done that. We've got that. We've nailed it. Uh, and we have we have, we have saved them uh, for posterity. But some of those 19th century women, we really know to, need to know who they are and to try to see if we can't find examples of their works in the attics and the cellars and the closets and maybe even on the walls of, uh, of, of people's houses. I would like to see more examples of these women's, uh, the work of the, by these women in the Newbert Museum. And uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a project that we can really undertake. Uh, and I would invite any of you, if you know about these people, if you run across examples, let me know. Here's my email, genoble at hogriver.com. It's easy to remember. By the way, no, no relation to, to the, uh, the Hog River Journal that, was, uh, that, was, that came after us, uh, but genoble at hogriver.com. Uh, so I invite you to, uh, to let me know. And if you have questions, uh, let me know that too. So at this point, I will, I will turn this over to, uh, to the moderator and thank you very much for making it this far into the presentation. Thank you so much, Gary. That was just absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for the gift of your wisdom today. <laughs> um, all of you watching and listening, please make note of Gary's email address. You can go ahead and send him questions directly to that email address. I also made note of all the posted questions and we'll be forwarding them to Gary as well. Be sure to check nbmaa.org for all of our many upcoming programs and the opening of Helen Frankenthaler Late Works. Have a wonderful week, and we hope to see you back at the museum very soon. Thanks, everyone.